Hey everyone, thank you for joining us once again for our E3 coverage for Polygon.com. I am Griffin McElroy. Joining me is my co-host, my colleague, Justin McElroy. Today we're talking to Oculus founder, Palmer Lucky. Hi, Palmer. How are you? I'm really, really tired. Just been demoing nonstop at E3. Thanks oh. for having me. Oh my God, we're only like a day and a half into E3. You gotta, you gotta buck up. You gotta take some... Well Eat some power no, no, bars. You guys are a day and a half into E3. When you exhibit at E3, you get here a couple days early and set up. Sure, and you had a press you had a press conference last week, so I imagine actually you are running pretty ragged right now. That is exactly right. Uh, I want to start by talking to you about that that press conference. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, we saw some some big announcements. We saw the final uh, uh, product version of the Oculus Rift. How do you feel like the the show went? Because it seems like a difficult way to showcase the hardware. I've always thought that for VR, the the optimal way is to actually put it on somebody's face and have them uh, go through it. How do, how do you feel like the press conference went? Nobody would disagree with you. I mean, that's why we're here at E3, because we have to get people trying VR to really understand it. Um, one of the reasons that our booths get bigger and bigger, it's not driven by vanity. It's driven by the fact that you have to get more people in to see this thing, because it's the only way that they're really going to understand it. And that's, gonna, that's true for whether you're showing your friends the Rift, or whether they're coming to our booth, or eventually when you'll be able to try it in retail. Uh, before you actually buy it, so that you know of what it is that you're buying. Um, but, you know, the press conference is, isn't really a necessarily a great way to get things across to people who will be buying the headset, but it's a good way to communicate with the press and the media and the public, you know, that your product's coming out. So if, if Oculus takes off, it's in every home in, in, in America in a, in a few years, I guess you could do a VR press conference. Like, that's the dream, right? Just Eventually, everybody put on your headsets yeah. and say, yeah. yeah. We've talked about that. It'll, it'll have to get to the point where a significant portion of your target audience already has your product. Like I'd say at this point, most people in America who are going to buy the next iPhone already own an iPhone. Right. So you know, if we can get to that point where people already have VR headsets uh, that are getting ready for the next one, that's when it will make sense. But I, I think we're VR is growing too fast right now for that to be the case. It's for the next several revisions, it's likely that huge swaths of the target audience are not going to be able to, uh, to are not even going to own a VR headset yet. Right. One of the big announcements was your partnership with Microsoft, and we saw the uh, Xbox One uh, streaming through Oculus Rift. Uh, and, and I wanted to ask, because there's been a lot of discussion about the hardware uh, on the, the PC side that's going to be required to uh, work with, with VR. Uh, is the Xbox One powerful enough to, uh, to power a native VR experience other than that, that the streaming that we saw uh, during the press conference? Yes. It, I mean, anything is possible driving VR if you're willing to reduce the graphics uh, to a low enough level. Like, uh, you might know about Gear VR, which we worked on in collaboration with Samsung. And Gear VR is running off of a Note or a Galaxy S is definitely less powerful than, uh, than, a, uh, than an Xbox One, at least right now. Um, if you can run good VR on that, you could run virtual reality off of a console. But... At the same time, what you're able to get from a PC right now versus a console, it's just a night and day, the quality that you can get. Um, are you worried at all about splitting the, the consumer base by launching with the Xbox One controller and then launching the touch motion controller later? No. I mean, what we've been working on VR games with developers for years now, like E Valkyrie and Lucky's Tale in particular, have literally been in development for years. And it's taken years for people to figure out how to make good VR games, even using game pads, despite the fact that game pads have decades of work behind them. People right. know how to make games that use them. Um, we wanted to make sure that developers could, we wanted to make sure that anyone who buys the Rift will be able to play the games that developers have been making without having to buy extra hardware, that they'd just be able to rely on every person who owns the Rift being able to play their game. And the Xbox game pad is the easiest way to get to that. And right now, almost all of the games that are going to be out at launch for the Rift, and even going through 2016, they've all been designed over the past few years for a gamepad. So bundling a motion controller for some bundling a motion controller isn't necessarily a huge win when you don't even have a large library of games or really any games at all that have that have uh, been shown to work with it well. I think it's also going to take time for people to figure out how to best use virtual reality input. Because unlike gamepads, there's not decades of precedent. They're going to have to learn a lot of things from the ground up. And while we have a lot of cool demos, some other companies have shown off some cool demos and some cool games, nobody's ever made a full, real game experience that you'd want to play for long periods of time using uh, you know, real one-to-one -one native motion controllers yet. Uh, so we want to make that available. We want to make it available to devs. We want people to be able to use it and to be able to play games that are across all the different platforms with motion controls. But right now we're focusing, at least at launch, for 
uh, those games that have been targeting gamepads for a long time. Uh, how do you solve the, the the chicken and egg problem that I think a lot of um, I think a lot of consoles run into right at the beginning of launch, but but they've you know figured out systems and <coughs> ways of adapting. It. But how do you solve the chicken and egg problem of developers not wanting to put a lot of muscle into development for VR until there's uh, a lot of market penetration and the market not wanting to buy the, the thing until there's a lot of software to, to play on it. So let's just be frank, it's not about muscle, it's about money. Oh, right. and that, was my, that was my figure. I know. <laughs> so I'm just boiling it down to that. If you could make yep. games through yep. tests of strength, that would be amazing. I agree. Uh, but you know what it really comes down to is those developers have the brawn, they have the brains, but what they lack are the resources to, to always be able to throw it at something that hasn't been proven yet. VR isn't a proven market. And so there's a lot of devs out there that wanted to make VR content and still want to make VR content, but aren't able to justify the risk and compared to a traditional game console or a PC game or a mobile game. Uh, what we've been doing is using a lot of our resources to try to take that risk off a lot of these people. So. Uh, there's a lot of games. We're showing off nine games at E3. Some of those are done through Oculus Studios, which uh, we, we we don't have. We decided that we don't want to be like Nintendo. We don't want to build all of the games for our platform. We'd much rather use our resources to help other companies succeed and sell stuff in VR. And so we've been funding a lot of titles, sometimes funding all of the development, sometimes partially funding the development to try and reduce their risk so that they can make a game and say, well, look, even if it all fails, we made a sweet game and we got, we paid everyone in our studio to do it. Um, and if it all takes off, they're even better off. So uh, it, it is a problem. We're trying to solve that chicken and egg problem more actively, I think, than anyone else in the industry. Uh, speaking of the industry, it seems like there's, there's, there's a lot of players uh, getting into the VR field. Um, is, is there sort of a hesitation at this point for uh, waiting to, to see somebody else take the first step and learn you know, from, from that uh, and, and use you know how the audience reacts well, to that first step uh, before you take your first step and, and planning accordingly, or is it a, a race to uh, to be? By first? first step, we mean like actually putting out putting out a thing and selling a consumer, it. Consumer yeah. facing part for sale. If you taught, if you would ask anybody on any of the teams that are trying to push VR out, they would tell you it's an absurd idea. Everyone really? is trying to push this thing as fast as they can. Now, people are focusing on different things. Some people are targeting you know certain types of experiences. Other people are focusing on consoles. Some on PC. But for everyone's individual strategy, I don't think anyone is saying, I know what we need to do. Our strategy is to wait and see what happens with that other company. Um, everyone is pretty confident in, in what they're shipping, including Oculus. See, that's why we ask the questions and you answer, because we have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. And I, I'm, yeah, I'm not putting you down, but I'm saying it, it really is funny. Like Another common misconception is people saying, wow, it must be a relief to finally announce what you're shipping and when. I'm like, that's ridiculous, because... <laughs> That's making a promise that we have to ship this thing at this date. That's not a relief at all. Uh, it was far more relieving when we could just not give any details and we could just <laughs> push it off. And you know, that's future Palmer's problem. I, I, I guess. I guess the the best metaphor we can make from from what we know uh, from from the gaming industry for the past two decades or so is is price because there's not a lot of info about anybody from from price, and that seems like the biggest reactionary thing of. Oh well, you're going to do five hundred dollars. We're at four hundred dollars. What's up now? Now we're in charge. That that's the kind of like delaying and waiting and, and comparison that I'm talking about. Is there any of that going on at all? You know, I think a lot of it's just, just driven by when the headsets are coming out. You know, some people are coming out earlier, some are coming later. Nobody's announced any pre-orders at this point. Not because of strategy. It's because I don't think anyone wants to take your money for a product that isn't coming out for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pre-orders shouldn't drag on for years and years. Uh, so we're going to start be taking pre-orders later this year, and we'll be obviously having to announce the price then. Uh, but when we announce pre-orders, price will be up there, and we won't be announcing price till we start taking your money. Sure. What, what do you think is... Uh, uh, I'm going to try and phrase this in a way where it doesn't sound like a trick question, because I don't mean it to be, but... It, what this is, is going to work. Trust me. Just hang with it. <laughs> what, what, what is... Electric. What is the right what is the right consumer price for VR, right? Like, we're starting to see televisions, the, the price of televisions plummet to the point where... If I had eight hundred dollars and and that would be the price of a TV in two thousand and five, and now if I I spent eight hundred dollars on a television now it would be this giant, massive wall sized screen. Yep. Like what what is going to be the impulse buy price for for VR uh, down the road? Well, it is it is going to be down the road. VR will not be an impulse purchase in the immediate future. It it just can't be. Uh, the technology that's required on the headset side is relatively costly. 
but you also need a really good PC to run VR to its full potential. Uh, the PC is going to cost a lot more than the headset, so really your investment isn't even as much on the VR side as the PC side. Um, but like TV, like phones are a lot like TVs. If you look back a few years, 2008, 2009, uh, think about like what kind of phone you could buy for six or seven hundred dollars, unsubsidized. We're not going to play games with subscriptions. Uh, and if you look at the phones that are available today, you can buy phones that are better than those five or six hundred dollar phones five years later for less than a hundred dollars unsubsidized. And you're going to see that same price drop in VR because there's a lot of uh, similar technology that's going to drop in a similar way. So I'd say five, ten years from now. You'll be able to buy headsets that are much better than the Rift that we're showing today at E3 for sub $100, and it will probably render a lot of things on board. And that that's going to be when it becomes an impulse purchase for a wide range of people. Right now, it's going to be gamers, enthusiasts, people who are really passionate about what VR can bring to them today. Um, I, 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 one last question. I, when you look at any new technology, and uh, the, the the parallel that I've seen some people draw uh, is 3D, but I... I uh, as somebody who's tried both, I don't think there's that much of an analog, but I think the point stands that when there's any new technology there, you get the initial sort of like wow factor. Um, and then as you're sort of immersed in the product or the game or the movie or whatever it is, that stuff kind of falls away um, uh, eventually. So my question is, as you look at a long-term play for VR, how do you keep that initial sense of, of wonder? How do you keep that there and present and, and keep you, you know, wowing people, but still make it a seamless experience that, you know, doesn't require any sort of prior knowledge to get on board with. All right, well, that's a few things to tackle. One, in terms of when 3D TV was taking off, but not really, it was largely being pushed by manufacturers. It was being pushed by manufacturers and content developers trying to find something to differentiate themselves and get more money out of people's pockets. Consumers didn't really react positively necessarily. 3D TV was not something that people were demanding, that they were saying, please get this in my hands. I'm going to go make angry comments on the internet about how I can't buy a 3D TV yet. Uh, VR is fundamentally different. If you show someone virtual reality, they're almost universally at least impressed. Even if they don't want to spend all the money it would take to get a gaming rig that can run it, they're still impressed. And they want it to be something that they can have. So in a way, VR, I've I've seen it as driven by what people want, what gamers want, and not so much by the tech manufacturers. And that goes all the way back to when we ran our Kickstarter. You know, we didn't think we were going to get such a positive response, but we did because people came out in, in force and said, virtual reality is something that's interesting, that this is something that we want to, want to have. Um, <clears throat> as far as that sense of wonder, you know, being able to continually impress people, there's two sides of it. One of them is the technology side. I mean, you can say this about any game console. Well, look, the graphics look good on the game console, but eventually they just look the same, and you know they, they don't blow you away. It's just the new normal. And that's absolutely right. You can't rely on hardware to instill a sense of wonder in people that will persist uh, because it's not about the hardware. The hardware becomes the new normal very fast. Uh, you just start to expect the cutting edge. So something that blew your mind a year ago, now it's just the new thing. And because of that, content is going to be what blows people away. Like the Rift, in a way, is a conduit for experiences that developers create. It's not, the hardware itself isn't supposed to impress you. It should be the games that people are building, the experiences that you're having, the people you're playing with. That's what's going to continually drive virtual reality innovation forward. And hardware will help that happen. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I, I can say that I've, Every month something comes by that still blows my mind, so I'm not burnt out on, on VR, and I use it more than any sane person should. <laughs> cool. Farmer Lucky, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join us today. I'm, I, I am looking for, I wish I was at uh, E3 so I could put that thing on my face, but I, uh, I guess I'll have to be patient. You'll, you'll get to try it soon enough, man. Cool. And thank you. Right. So, I'll see both of you guys. Thank you so thank much you. for joining us, uh, and thank you for watching at home. Uh, stay tuned for more E3 coverage throughout the week.